Hello. It sounds like it's working now. Hello. Hi, uh, Shruti. Hello. Hello, hello, hello. Good to see you. <laughs> Good to see you. How have you been? I'm, I'm, I'm doing very well, thank you. Looks like we got this uh, this thing working here, so we should be good to go. Yes. Um, all right. Uh, so do we have uh, Professor Heidegger here? Yes, we have Professor Heidegger here, and he's a very, very sweet soul. Good. Excellent. Uh, yes. Sorry about the delay today. I was just caught up with something personal. Oh, no, that's okay. Uh, don't even worry about it. Um, oh, we just have the flu going, isn't it? Oh. Uh, the flu? Uh, yeah, a little bit. It's mostly gone. Uh, so I'm, okay. I'm, I'm good now. Uh, a little bit stuffy, but it's not too bad. Um, all right. So, uh, how should we address, uh, is it, uh, should we call him Professor Heidegger? Is that how he prefers? He's, he's very, very sweet. He says, it's up to you who you want to address, <laughs> but he like he's okay with professor. Okay. Okay, good. All right. Well, let's get right into it then. Um, my first question for you, uh, Professor Heidegger, um, is that in your interview with Der Spiegel magazine, uh, you said when asked about the problem of contemporary global technology, you said that only a god could save us. And uh, I'm wondering what you meant by that. Is there a way that you could clarify that? Did, did you mean like a literal god or uh, a new religion or what did you mean? Um, he said it was more like an expression. Um, so can you get a feedback going? Uh, you know what? I let me put my headphones on. That should eliminate the feedback. Uh, okay. Let's see here. Okay. Uh, and so his answer yeah, was funny. that uh, it was an expression. Yeah, he, he was saying it was just an expression in the sense what he meant by God is the literal way of how we understand God as a being who is more powerful than all of us. Mm -hmm. So that is what he meant by that. Okay. Um, He's going on to explain it further. Okay. Saying that... Um, Because we um, we have created technology in a way which which has become destructive and out of control. <clears throat> so um, so we together are not so powerful, or we cannot control it, and it has become destructive. So we need something more powerful than ourselves, like a god, um, who would be able to control it for us. That's what he meant. I mean, doesn't this apply a shift out of a uh, uh, out of a purely philosophical attitude into an attitude that's more proper to that of a religious sensibility? Oswald Spengler, for instance, uh, mm -hmm. said in the decline of the West that uh, as the West declines, it would enter into what he called a second religiousness, so that mm -hmm. there would begin to rise and spread a new kind of uh, religious consciousness. Do you see this? kind of religious consciousness coming in to replace the philosophical consciousness? Do, do we need to become more pious? We need to become religious. He, he, he doesn't think we need to become more religious, but he thinks that through, through that we need to um, start asking questions. He's encouraging us to ask questions. Why does religion say this and that? And uh, really question everything that has been said in religion. So study it to question it. And that will give us a deeper understanding of, of our life. Mm -hmm. Us and why we are and just, um, uh, yeah, just the world and us being in it. Right. Um, in your paper on the end of philosophy and the task of thinking, uh, Professor Heidegger, you say that uh, Western philosophy is essentially over since its task has been taken over by the sciences. Um, and you point out how the same thing happened uh, to the Greeks during the Alexandrian age. 
Has philosophy now become completely superfluous to the civilization? Is there any point in pursuing it at all? He is talking about how philosophy will always be a part of the culture. Um, it might take different shape and form, but it will always be in some form a part of culture and thinking. Any he he's talking about any sort of um, way of thinking about a person who gets real and thinks about life and being is a philosopher. Anyone. So that will always be a part of um, the culture and the masses, um, although that might be called different things, but mm. it will always be a part. Okay. Um, your idea of being seems to function in your system as a kind of semiotic placeholder uh, for what earlier philosophers used to refer to by God. I mean, in a certain way, doesn't the idea of being for you become uh, an equivalent to, to an idea of God in, in your system? Are there, is there an equivalence between the two? Uh, no. For him, being means trying to understand um, ourselves, our truth, our truth, ourself, and um, He, th he, 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 um, he thinks it's it's just about being uh, trying to understand ourselves and asking questions and being true and being authentic is what um, for him means being and um, he it of a headless chicken so it, it, <laughs> I think what it means is not just running around like a headless chicken and sort of having a conscious thought about how we live our life and where we need to go so being um, um, aware of what we want and where we want to go and then being authentic to that that goal um, is what he thinks or he feels uh, is being for him Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, of all the German philosophers uh, that preceded you, Professor Heidegger, Kant, Fichte, and Schelling, and Nietzsche, and Hegel, um, I'm curious which of them was your favorite? Can you say those names again, please? Uh, Kant, Fichte, Schelling, Hegel, Schopenhauer, Nietzsche. The second name that you took shines out. Uh, Kant Fichte? Mm -hmm. Fichte? Yeah. Oh, really? Well, that seems an unlikely choice. I wouldn't have guessed Fichte. Was, <laughs> uh, okay. What about Schelling, though? Schelling also stood out, but the second name felt more powerful to me. I That's see. Why. I see. Mm -hmm. Because didn't the, doesn't the concept of being really, doesn't it come from Schelling? I mean, isn't... Uh, wasn't it Schelling who first uh, sort of articulated the concept of being and then didn't that influence your, your being concept, Professor Heidegger? He agrees to it. He says yes. Mm -hmm. um, um, he, he says he did get influenced by him. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> but when he has those names, the second name, felt powerful to me. Okay, okay. Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> shifting gears here a little bit, uh, I want to get into some of these questions that I know uh, people are going to want to know some of the answers to. Um, you talked, Professor Heidegger, in your black notebooks about the disastrous influence of what you called world Judaism on modernity. Uh, you seem to have identified the Jews with scientific and rational thinking. In a way, I mean, doesn't this go too far? Surely science and technology are a much larger endeavor than anything that can just be reduced to Jewish thinking. Wasn't that a bit xenophobic on your part, a bit paranoid? Um, I 
I believe he sees them as the pioneer for that. I'm sorry, I didn't understand. He sees what? I, he sees them as the pioneer, pioneering um, race for that, uh, because um, he's saying that it's all it all started from them. The whole um, the energy of how the science and technology has shaped today, and the and and the power of it uh, was first recognized by Jews. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is why he put it the way he put it. Uh, were you a true anti-Semite, uh, Professor Heidegger? Anti-Semite. Anti-Semite? Uh, what is um, Well, there seems to be some ambiguity on the subject since many people who are close to you, like Edmund Husserl and Hannah Arendt, were Jews. Mm -hmm. uh, did you really hate Jews? I mean, th there seems to be some debate about this. Um, <laughs> he's saying he, he he's not saying he hated Jews. He's saying he was not very fond of them in particular. I see. Okay. Um, uh, just because um, of um, <laughs> he's explaining it. He's saying because he thought that they had um, no foundation. Or um, or they didn't have sort of no moral foundation, or that's why it's it's his opinion. So whatever they were doing, it was almost driven uh, by um, the desire for something like power or knowledge or whatever it was. So um, so there was no moral sort of. Uh, foundation. There was no foundation. Let's just say there was no foundation, rather than moral. But he's saying that there was no foundation or real deep thinking about why uh, we are doing what we're doing, and there was just sort of um, heading ahead with what we want to achieve for our desires. So for that reason, um, uh, he had the opinion that he had. I see. Um, have you had any contact with your mentor Edmund Husserl? on the other side. Have you apologized for him to, to him for striking his name out of the fifth edition of Being in Time? I'm just curious. He's saying he did meet him, but he's saying I did not feel the need to apologize. I see. And okay. he did not um, feel the need for me to apologize as well. Okay. Um, there was a full understanding. Mm -hmm. well, what about uh, Hannah Arendt? Have you had any contact with her on the other side? Yes, very much so. And he's still, um, he is uh, working with her. Oh, good. Do okay. Yes. yes. He, it's, he's very happy. His energy is very mm, happy when you took her name for some reason. Um, I'm curious, do you regret your involvement with the Nazis during uh, 1933 when you were doing everything you could to discredit uh, your Jewish colleagues, accusing them of being either pacifists or not sufficiently enthusiastic about the Nazi revolution? Do you see all this now as a big mistake? He's saying, of course, it's obvious that it would feel like a mistake, and it does feel like a mistake. Um, although he's saying the word "colored," so um, so he's talking about um, being under the influence of um, I don't know. Was he influenced by Hitler and? Yes. Mm -hmm. So he was um, under the influence from him and agreed with him and was empathetic towards him mm -hmm. and his experience. So he, um, yeah. So he was under the influence. 
Since you never commented publicly on the Holocaust, uh, I was wondering if you would care to take the opportunity to comment on the deaths of six million Jews in, during this interview. Is there anything that you would like to say about that? Uh, He is talking about how that part of the history in humankind has a very deeper meaning and it, it all had a purpose in our um, being. All of this had a purpose in our being. And um, he's talking about how, how cruel that was. And it was cruel what happened. Um, but it is important to understand that all of this had a deeper meaning. And and where we are today um, is because of that history that we lived. What was the deeper meaning? He's talking about evolution and how um, we have. He's talking about when you have darkness and then some a light shines onto it, then you know that there is this darkness and there's uh, there's the light. You see the difference. You see the duality. Mm. So the the purpose of it was to bring into light this duality that we do not want in our collective consciousness anymore. I see. Okay. Um, have you had contact with Hitler on the other side? He, yes. Um, but it's, he's, he's also going on to say that it's not how you would imagine. Hmm. He's saying the contact was, um, um, and, and what we what they spoke about, and the type of interaction he he had was very unexpected, or not what you would think. Uh, can you describe it a little more? Like, wh how was it different? Was it amicable? Was it hostile? <laughs> I mean, give us some idea. Hmm. Um, he gives me a feeling and he says it was like, whoa, what was that? <laughs> sort of a feeling. I see. Um, so it's almost like there was an immediate understanding of yeah. what all that was. And um, um, and he's saying he met Hitler after he had had a he had gone through the healing um, healing space. So the interaction was very amicable and um, um, they were on the same pages um, and they could discuss about what happened in a very neutral, objective way. Okay, um, getting back to the subject of technology, um, you spent a great deal of your career sort of battling against it, and you were one of the first to really warn about the dangers of globalization. Uh, such distance annihilating technologies, you wrote, only make the near far and the far near, but they have a nihilistic effect on local values. Has contemporary technology gotten it completely out of hand? Is it, is it something that... Um, has it played out the way that you were afraid that it was going to? Yes. Um, but I didn't, but he's saying there were other, um, there were other parts to it as well, which he couldn't 
or he didn't see um, of how it's going to serve the greater purpose. Um, so everything he mentioned about how technology can be destructive is uh, has come forward the way he imagined. Uh, but there's also other parts um, where it has been good for humanity, um, which he sees now. Mm -hmm. Will there come a time ever in human history when global technology will become a thing of the past? I mean, will we ever outgrow it? It's giving me a glimpse of um, future. So he's giving me like little images which I need to put together. Um, did you say global technology? Yes. Um, it will always be a part of humanity in some way. Um, although the the form of the form of it will completely change. Um, it will not look at all how it looks now. Um, because he's saying there will be telepathic abilities that are that that will develop um, amongst us. Um, but there will still be a place for technology always. Technology meaning he explains, he says, um, in the physical form, the way we um, we use technology to manipulate the physical form, the material existence. So that will always be there as long as we are in the material form. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, you wrote, Professor Heidegger, about how today beings have been abandoned by being. Um, do you still think this is true? I mean, what sort of life would consist in a, in a proper relationship to being? <clears throat> Very interesting. He shows, um, he takes me to the heart chakra. So that's the the chakra which is um, um, in the middle um, of our chest. And it's, it's to do with emotions. And it's to do with um, being connected with our emotions. It's to do with um, just being authentic to ourselves and what our needs are and what we want and not come under the pressure of um, our environment, which includes other beings, which includes the rest of us. You know? So um, a person who's more, um, who goes inwards and asks questions and tries to understand what um, he or she desires or, or wants or needs for himself and lives um, true to those um, emotions, true to, to his own desires and not um, influenced or under pressure or in fear of the outside environment is a um, real being for him. Okay. <coughs> don't live under the pressure and don't do what the environment or others tells you to do or what everybody else is doing. Uh, always ask question to yourselves and then be authentic to the to yourself. So pay attention to the answers that come forward and have the courage to live uh, according to what comes through to you. Uh, Professor Heidegger, you were not a fan of big cities like Berlin and Tokyo and London and New York. Um, what I'm wondering is, are such places necessarily at odds with being, or is it possible to live an authentic life uh, even in such environments? <clears throat> he's talking really fast. He's saying a lot of things all at once. I'm gonna ask him to slow down a little bit. Um, Firstly, said, um, 
he, he's saying that's true that he didn't like cities and he's going on to explain that he he's saying because uh, it's such a well made structure the city you know everything flows smoothly in the city sort of it's more influenced by the technology and the science and and the organizations you know it's very well organized the cities so it's it leaves very less space for us to be authentic to ourselves so we follow the system and we become a part of it and everything else is taken care of for us there's not much thinking we need to do we had to just go to the office get do the job come back and we sort of become a part of that system which is created by i don't, don't know who you know so um so because of that reason um uh, he he's talking about how we become like um, machine itself you know just sort of living in that particular way and just going on life every day in that routine but uh, away from the um cities where there are less certainties where we have to think and live and contemplate um it's easier for us to be authentic to ourselves that makes sense okay um in your letter on humanism you wrote that there is an absolutely unbridgeable abyss between the human and the animal uh you said that man is not just a rational animal not just an animal with a who happens to have the faculty of reason added on to it uh but there's a total ontological abyss of difference between the two what i'm wondering is when you got onto the under, uh, to the other side do you still see the matter the same way or do you see that there's more of a continuum between the human and the animal saying i can very clearly see the continuum now between the human and the animal um he's talking about the change of perspective when you are here and when you are there and how that changes um so he's he does see the continuum now and he does see the relationship um and the level of consciousness and the level of understanding that the animals hold as well okay um i mean <clears throat> rationality and language are something that evolution found a way to situate in the line of the apes um so rationality and language has come out of uh hominids and apes um i'm wondering could evolution have taken another direction could could the principle of rationality and world building could could that have come out of the reptilian line just as well was there a reason why it had to be apes such an interesting question thank god um okay I don't like talking about these things. Um I I you know because I just I sound so crazy. <laughs> But he's saying that um intelligence did come through through the reptilians as well as well. And there is a reptilian race as well somewhere. Oh, okay. On another planet? Um Yes, and also on this planet. Rational reptiles? Yes. That's why I said I hate talking about these things you know they make me sound crazy but that's what he say I I yeah All right well that that one is a little hard to digest I mean could he yeah. be more specific what, what does he mean Um he, he's literally saying there is a race that um that has um evolved 
uh, from reptiles and that is rational and um, can communicate mm -hmm. what we would call a language. I see. Um, when you look at our closest relatives, <clears throat> which are basically chimpanzees, right? I mean, that's the next closest thing to us. There's a pretty big gap there. Um, what I'm wondering is um, whether you know Professor Heidegger, did, is that gap there because um, humans uh, wiped out all their competitors, such as Homo habilis and Homo erectus, anything that was either you know, even remotely similar to uh, humans, uh, were they just wiped out? Is that why there's such a big gap? Um, he says there were two things. The first is um, how how we bred amongst each other. So it was the natural selection of an intelligent being selecting an intelligent being. Yeah. So uh, that. So we were very close at one point, chimpanzees and us, let's say, and then there was a natural selection which just separated those two um, species and one species took off in one direction, the other species took off in the other direction. They're let, he's saying, let's say they are humans, but they choose to live uh, like that in the trees. Okay, It's a different way of of experiencing life that they have chosen. We have chosen this way. And um, the second, yeah, second is, is the spiritual basis. That that's a one type of experience a consciousness can have. And this is another type of experience, a more evolved one, a more deeper one, a more um, <coughs> where we can experience a, a wider array of, um, of emotions, a wider array of um, um, thoughts. Um, so um, that being another reason. Mm -hmm. So there was you no know, another species that was completely wiped out. Okay. Um, Professor Heidegger, is there a philosopher you regard as having come the closest since your time to understanding being properly? Sorry, I don't know the names of... Uh, Is there any philosopher that has come close? He's saying there are many. Okay. Um, if you ask me for a name, um, If you give me a few names, I might be able to pick one of these. Oh, that's that's okay. I, I was just wondering if, if if he had anyone in in particular. Okay. That, that that's okay. We don't need to go down a list. Any. Yeah. But he said he said that um, not all of them are known. Okay, not all of them are known. Okay, yeah. Um, in your rectorship address of 1933, you first talked about this concept of the other beginning or a new beginning that you said would come after the end of the metaphysical age that began with Plato had ended. Um, I'm wondering if you could talk more specifically about this, the nature of this other beginning. Has this other beginning uh, begun? Is it something that we're in now? He 
he's saying yes to it. It has begun according to him. Mm-hmm. How he said it. Um, he he's talking about we are moving from um, what is it called? Um, you know where men dominate but now also women are coming up mm. um so um so that's bringing a new thinking women are bringing in new thinking mm. and because of that we are we are becoming um there's a new way of thinking coming and there's new perspective coming which is more emotion based Mm-hmm. so um so that he believes is a new way of being where we are more connected to ourselves our emotions and that has started that has begun already okay um your relationship with plato is kind of a troubled one on the one hand you sort of regarded him as the beginning of the decline of western philosophy into this idea of being as idos uh in which there is a an ontological disjunction between being and becoming um i'm wondering how do you feel about plato now do you still uh regard him as representing the beginnings of the decline of western philosophy <clears throat> did he not like plato was that the Well, his attitude toward him is not clear. It's it's very uh ambivalent, I think. Um Because he's not giving me um a feeling of not liking him. Okay. He's actually giving me a feeling of um of of he did good. Whatever okay. Plato did. Um he started something good. That feeling. Okay. Um so yes, um he 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 still um he so what he said um about plato he said yes and he still believes that it was the end of the beginning what what did you say uh the, the plato i mean plato plato and aristotle are normally regarded as the crown yeah. jewels of western philosophy but heidegger yeah. sort of turned that upside down and yeah. said that they represented actually the beginnings of the decline of western the western philosophy yes. into so, rationality and scientific thinking <clears throat> so he he believes that what plato did is right i mean he is good not right it's good um whatever he started was good um um it was still better in the sense that it was what he started was still better than what was before mm. um and and has um um has really been the the driving um the carrier of um the new thinking he has been the carrier of the new thinking in some way so uh, what he did was important according to Have you had any contact with Plato on the other side? Not um not a very regular and deep contact, but yes, awareness of each other. Okay. Um <clears throat> I'm curious Professor Hardiger, what was one of your favorite past lives? Past lives. um he he shows me um a lady a very um simple 
normal in a humble household lady just living a very normal life mm. you know so getting married having children taking care of them taking care of the house um so just a very simple and very connected um very authentic person this lady not um much to prove to the world not much to achieve she's just living a very simple and very uh plain life okay very yeah that that felt very authentic to him very connected to earth and to nature to herself mm. so that influenced him do you plan on incarnating again anytime soon yes um uh, but he's waiting for some very particular um if you look at it in a linear way then he's look at he's he he's waiting for some very particular time um in our um evolution okay. to incarn do you want to go and he's going deeper into it and explaining when okay <clears throat> He is talking about a world when um you know how at the moment um the technology science is the biggest thing and everyone bets on that or everyone that's the there's nothing um that's more factual or that's more guaranteed than science and there's nothing more powerful than technology at the moment and everyone agrees with that technology who whoever has the best technology <laughs> is wins So he's saying there will be a time when it will not be like this and it will be different. And there will be other things that will be that will hold more value for us. Um so I want to in Canada at that time. Okay. All right. Um have you ever lived on any other planets than Earth? Yes. You yeah. have. Yes. Yes, yes. He shows me. Huh? Many of them or or No, one. He just shows me one at the moment. Oh, I see. Yeah. Okay. It's a very strange planet. <laughs> Can you describe it? Do you have a visual of it? It looks like water. It has um water form. Mm. Um but it's mainly red uh it has a red landscape um a little bit of green red la- landscape and um some sort of um plant life which is also red and hence the red landscape um yes that's how it looks okay yes mm-hmm. okay uh professor hadiger those are all the questions that i had for you today uh thank you very much for uh for showing up and agreeing to this interview it's, it's been a real pleasure having your company yes he's saying uh he he's saying it was um it was nice talking to um to us here in the physical yeah it's been a long time he says so he enjoyed uh, that mm-hmm. oh good
That's great. All right, then. Uh, so we'll sign off for today. Okay. Okay.